we are going to jump into the final message of our Genesis series. Um, and this series is focused in specifically on Genesis 1 through 11, which really is the origin of everything. It's the beginning of everything. Um, it's really the beginning of desire. Um, and I would say that desire is one of those themes that um, actually um, motivates human history. Um, desire is one of the, desire is not an, uh, an animal instinct. Uh, desire is one of the unique aspects of what it means to be made in the image of God. Uh, and desire is the source of sin as well as this beautiful reality of what it means to be an image bearer of God because desire misdirected is how we end up in the predicaments that we end up in. Um, that the goal of the Christian life, what Jesus came to reveal to us and what he desired for us to imitate was his desire to be one with the Father. Um, and that is what the Christian life is about. It's about being realigned that God has created us with a hunger, with a desire that will not be satisfied with anything but Him. Um, but we constantly try to fill that void uh, with good things, even blessings from God, um, and we misuse them um, and we redirect um, our hearts and our minds toward an attempt to bring some kind of fulfillment to that existential need for belonging. Uh, and it's, it's misplaced desire. And Genesis 1 through 11 gives us the journey of that reality throughout this narrative. Uh, and it's important for us to understand that in this closing story around the Tower of Babel. Now, um, to begin on the Tower of Babel, I want to actually be, start with its reversal. And its reversal took place on the day of Pentecost. And on Pentecost, we are told in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, you remember Jesus has, has been resurrected. Uh, he has revealed himself uh, to, his, uh, to his disciples. Uh, he has been with them for 40 days uh, and has, has given them the great commission. Uh, and then we're told in the beginning of Acts that that Jesus was taken um, into the heavens before their very eyes. That Jesus, is, he, that we saw the incarnation is God's descent to meet man in his brokenness. Uh, the resurrection is Christ's victory over death, um, but the ascension is Christ uh, returning to. Uh, to that place of glory that he had with the Father before, but it's actually different now because the return is as a man. The gods, that the creator became creature, um, and what we're told in the Nicene Creed that God became a man for us. And I think it's important to remember that he lived as a man perfectly for us, and that he died as a man for us, and that he rose from the dead as a man for us, and he ascended to the right hand of the Father as a man for us. And on the day of Pentecost is the fulfillment of that great promise in which Jesus made in the upper room, in which he said, it is good that I go to the Father, for when I go to the Father, I will send to you another helper, the Spirit of Truth. And the Spirit of Truth, when he comes, he will bring to remembrance all that I have said, that he will convict the world of sin and of judgment and of righteousness because he is first and foremost a missionary spirit who is to point the world to its savior, which is Jesus himself. And I, I, and I wanna set it up with this because we're gonna jump into, at, um, uh, beginning next week, we're gonna be, begin a short um, series uh, that'll go before and after Easter Sunday on the role of the Holy Spirit. And I think that this is a good, uh, a good ending story in Genesis to actually begin that because I think there's lots of questions and lots of confusion around the Holy Spirit. Um, in, uh, but that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit hasn't been fully active doing what he's always been doing, which is pointing the world to Jesus. <laughs> so uh, 
I love this in Acts chapter 2 Jesus told his disciples to go and wait for the coming promise and they saw him ascend and remember they were looking up into the heavens and the angel said why are you looking up Jesus is gonna come back the same way you just saw him leave you need to go and I think this is important for us to, to know that man's tendency um, to, to look in the wrong direction uh, Babel actually has that at its source let us build to the heavens rather than obey God which is go into all the world and be fruitful um, and there the disciples go to the upper room and they pray and when the Holy Spirit comes we are told that they went out um, of the upper room and began declaring the glory of God essentially declaring the gospel message and this is what it says in Acts chapter 2 verses 5 through 6 now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews devout men from every nation under heaven that's an important um, statement uh, and at the sound of the multitude at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language what was the Tower of Babel Babel is uh, is is uh, means confusion it also means the gate of heaven uh, but confusion it's the place where God confused the languages of humanity a single language of people brought together with a deep desire to make a name for themselves to build a tower into the heavens to basically immortalize their own achievements man's obsession with fulfilling God's covenantal command to bring dominion to the world but man as dominators apart from God only bring destruction and so God confuses that language and disperses the people in Pentecost all of it has its meaning we see it as just this act what I don't want you to read in the Tower of Babel is just is just God's judgment on the stupidity and wickedness of man because actually what it is is God's blessing through his judgment to fulfill his intent his intent that began um, on page one of the Bible when he created everything and what did he tell man be fruitful go into all the world and be fruitful and multiply and God has to intervene in man's sinfulness to actually fulfill what he desired and he disperses the people confuses their language and Pentecost is a place in which we see that God's purposes was always his heart was always for the world and now you bring you see that the gospel is the thing that reunites a divided and fragmented humanity and all of a sudden everyone's hearing the gospel proclaimed in their own language the single message of God's grace that the message is not simply words but it is the living word Jesus himself um, and you see that the grand narrative of the gospel um, that God is never loses control of his story and I think that's very important for us in a time where I feel like Christians are grasping at straws to try to control what they feel is a losing narrative for Christians and I just want to remind you that there have been many points in the church's history where it seemed like the church was going to lose where God somehow failed in his covenantal promises but none of this has taken God by surprise and all you need to do because what we're going to jump into after we do a series on the Holy Spirit is we're going to begin a deep dive into yes revelation and we're going to look at this as as a book that it is primarily a revelation of Jesus himself and that God has never lost control of his narrative and he knew that it would get worse before it got better but this is the beauty of the gospel God's ability to weave the dissonant notes of human history into his redemptive song and that is a powerful thing that we must grasp and so when we look at this final story um, I want us to think of it in terms of the warnings of our own darker nature our own desire to be our own gods 
which is always at play. And don't think because you're a follower of Jesus and you read your Bible every day and you have a community group that you don't still try to take control of your own life. Sin is always at the door crouching and I promise you in one way or another you will open it every, every day at some point. There is no sinlessness on this side of eternity but there can be total surrender to the king who is sinless and allow him to be in control of our glitchy sinful vehicles by which he brings glory to the world in spite of us and through us. So let's jump in to this narrative. We begin with the builder's pursuit. And I want you to see that as I've been showing you throughout the Genesis 1 through 11 series that there are continual repetitions of patterns, motifs that are already circling, have already circled multiple times. And this is one of those motifs that is very similar, the outcome of sin. There is an interesting focus, uh, focal point for the Hebrew writers, even on direction, location. What happens when Adam and Eve, um, when Adam and Eve are removed from the garden, which direction do they go? East, east of Eden. Steinbeck didn't come up with that. And some of you are like, who's that? And shame on you, if that's you. Um, <laughs> although I think he's an overly sentimental writer personally uh, and uh, not a big fan of Steinbeck or Hemingway. A couple of books by Hemingway. They're better, they're better. If you wanna know who is better, ask me later because it has nothing to do with this message. Uh, <laughs> uh, east of Eden, what happens when Cain kills his brother? He goes east. And what does Cain do when he goes east? What's the first thing he does? He builds a city, a city of refuge. The same existential crisis of Cain, which is, I have been rejected by God and I have nowhere to belong. What does he do? He goes and takes it upon himself to create meaning for himself and he builds the city. And the city becomes actually the source of humanity coming together apart from God and now becoming conduits of we are builders, but we are also violent. And this weird, uh, this weird merging of the violent nature or the warlike nature of humanity um, and this creative ability to, to make and to build. You remember through Cain's lineage, one of the things I thought was so fascinating is the lineage of Cain. It's like every cool thing comes through Cain's line. The they musical instruments, uh, all, the, all, the, all the tools necessary to build civilization. Cities come, and then you get to the godly line, and what comes through the godly line? It's just, all, it's just a bunch of dudes that just live a super long time. And you're like, well, that's, it's kind of like the, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is a Hallmark movie, and everybody in this room except for some uh, women love that hate that channel hate it my mom, my wife likes it you're like you can't say that about women but i did i did um and some of you're like i hate it too and i'm like that's good you understand but what is it about these things even as christians why is it that we are drawn just as much as the world to violence vengeance we love vengeance flicks i just watched dune 2 uh what a wow it's an incredible movie. Uh, visually stunning and deeply disturbing, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it, is, it is one of those movies that I actually think it does a good job of not glamorizing vengeance. It's showing it as a, mis a mistake. Um, but, the, but the reality is, is that we go to the theaters to watch the things that we would never do. We love to watch other people do it through our entertainment. Isn't it funny? Like, I would never kill someone, but I'll watch... I'll watch murderers every week on my TV shows. And this is the thing, the human heart has a desire for the things that are forbidden, the things that actually cause damage to our lives. And the things that God says is good, we often say, I'm not interested in that. Those things don't hold appeal because we often identify more fully 
with the broken side of our lives rather than the ideal in which God has called us to. Um, so here uh, in Genesis 11, what you see, now we know that Cain's descendants were wiped off the face of the planet in the flood, but what we have here are the, what I would refer to as the spiritual descendants of Cain. That the problem of sin hasn't gone anywhere and so it returns right to where it was before. And here's what we're told. Now the whole earth had one language. I want you to take note of how many times language um, is utilized because it's important um, in understanding that God is a God who speaks and that language is the thing that God gives power to man as the ability to what? Name things. And, the, and naming things is actually to speak meaning into existence in life. Um, and so here we have the whole earth had one language and the same words, the same dialect. So it's not even like, you know, if you're like a, if you are in the UK and you go to London, they speak English, but you go to Scotland, they say they speak English. England's hard enough to understand. And then you go to Scotland and you're like, I have no idea. And like Ireland, Wales is a little bit like that too. It's the same language, different dialects. Here we're told that there was a unity of language that even were the dialects the same. There's a, there's a reality, but there's, the purpose is not to necessarily state emphatically that it was the same dialect, but to put an emphasis on the importance of words in this story. Um, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And remember what I said about Shinar. This is essentially the land of sin. It is the land in which, um, which often the very violent nations that would be constantly a thorn in Israel's flesh would come from and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and vitamin for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make what? A name for ourselves. Notice the repurposing of naming. Naming instead of being an outward, um, an outward movement as co-laborers with God to bring the world um, under, uh, under submission in grace now becomes an inward turn toward man trying to become his own God. I will take control of what it means to be a human being. Now, I wanna just ask you the very simple question. In the conversations happening in our culture today, does that sound unfamiliar? Does it not seem like humans are in this fascinating place of redefining for themselves what it means to be human beings? I made a joke a, a while ago. I saw this article um, around, uh, around this whole movement in Portland because, um, you know, keep Portland weird. Uh, we went from, I liked it when Portland was weird. I really did. Um, I, and, and I have rediscovering my love for Portland these days uh, in all of its weird, quirky history. Uh, but there was, a, there was a period, and I still see them occasionally on Hawthorne, but there was a group of self-proclaimed elves. And they all wear prosthetic ears. But then I read this article with them, because uh, this is a movement not just in Portland, but it was this idea that this is the next stage of evolution of people choosing for themselves, this is what I, this is who I am on the inside. And that rise of the language that I like to use is the, um, that I, I borrow from Charles Taylor um, in his massive, very important book that nobody wants to actually read called The Secular Age. Uh, James K. Smith actually wrote a small book um, uh, popularizing many of Taylor's ideas called How Not to Be Secular. Um, but that concept of the rise of the psychological self um, that is disconnected from reality as we see it. In other words, 
what I feel to be true is actually the truest thing about me. Um, that doesn't seem that different from what we have happening in this story. In, in other words, the problem remains. And with every technological advance, here's the thing, we have come to the place in our world in which the physical body, it's very Gnostic in its idea that the thing that is real is the spirit of man and our physical bodies are, are things that can be manipulated, literally manipulated through technology to be whatever we want to be. And we see this playing out, it's playing out in our public discourses and I use the example of elves as because as, it seems outrageous, but you could actually have surgery to your ears and if that's what it means to be an elf, you could become one. Uh, people do all kinds of weird things. I, I watched, you guys, I shouldn't admit that I watched this, but you cannot take your eyes off of it. Have you ever wasted time watching that TV show, Botched? Which is just like botched plastic surgeries. I'm, everyone looks at me like, no, that sounds disgusting. I've never seen it either. Um, I would never watch such trash. Um, but I watched this poor boy try to turn himself into Justin Bieber. I couldn't stop watching it. Maybe it's because I met Bieber's father-in-law and he's, I was like, I, I just felt some kind of connection to it. But uh, this kid was like, and he didn't look anything like Justin Bieber. That was the saddest part. But he was doing everything he could to reshape his face. And the plastics, are, and he's under 30 years old, and he's done like hundreds of surgeries to make himself look like Justin Bieber. What a terrifying thing. And people like me were like, well, that's crazy. I'll watch it. Um, and that kind of speaks to our voyeuristic culture too. I say that to my shame. I really did only watch it one night, and I'm like, this is not a healthy show for me. I don't need to know this, because it's not helping my cause in, um, in my, this is where you start to believe that maybe God has indeed lost control. Um, and, but he hasn't. And it's the heartbreak because in, in, in the body of this boy who's changing his body to be what he believes himself to be, which is not true because there's only one Justin Bieber. And you can be a believer, <laughs> but you can't be the Bieber. That's the, and I just want you to know, I didn't rehearse that. That just came to me right now because I'm a poet. Um, and I'll forget I said it, uh, but, uh, but, but that's, reality is not what's important in our culture because we are still buying into the same lie that we find at the Tower of Babel. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let us redefine what it means to be human. And what it is, the builder's pursuit is ultimately an existential pursuit of a, a desire, a right desire, but it's a desire displaced. It is the desire to belong and to actually do something of significance. We want to do something that matters. We want, when I say it's a pursuit of immortality, I'm not even necessarily saying that there was some sort of belief that they would live forever, but it is the idea that I can at least create a legacy that will be remembered. But one of the most horrifying facts, because in a, in a, in a day in which um, technology uh, is, is the new skyscrapers, if you will, of the world, man's ability to build into arenas that we've never been, it's, we are able to play God more fully than we have ever been able to play. We are able to create new realities. You think about the metaverse and literally a virtual real estate company, there's many of them that exist that are selling virtual real estate for the metaverse. You can buy blocks in Portland right now and people think that it might be a value someday because of people's new movement toward virtual reality as some sort of augmented reality. This is the ideal. Do you, you remember when Avatar came out? Not the good Avatar, the last airbender, um, and I only mean the cartoon. Uh, but the, the blue people avatar. They remember they, they called it the avatar blues after watching that? That people was like, I want to live in that world. It's so beautiful. I, and people experienced depression because it was such an all-encompassing environment. All we are doing now is creating technology that allows us to enter into that world and stay there. 
Um, and so much of what was science fiction novels even 20 years ago is becoming a reality for us now. And this is the continual attempt for human beings as builders to pursue some sort of kind of mystical meaning out of life, but apart from the Creator, apart from God. Essentially, it's our desire to be God. And it's, it's desire displaced, and it's deeply, it's deeply troubling. I was watching, uh, I was watching uh, um, a, a special on just the, the rise of social media, but then I, I, I was like, God, this is so depressing. And then I open, I'm like, I'm gonna read the news instead. Not helpful. Uh, and the first article that popped up was the um, exploitation of children by parent influencers. Parents that are making millions of dollars by posting pictures to strangers of their kids on Instagram. And, and, and there are no laws to protect the kids or to give them anything. So there was an interview with a girl who was, um, was the daughter of, she stays anonymous, but um, they, they made sure that she really was a famous influencer's kid. She's in her 20s now because it's been going already on for like, like 20, 30 years, 20 years. Uh, and she, she made her mom millions of dollars and never got a penny of it. And the kind of language that the mom would use is, hey, that's not a good smile. Don't you know that this is how we pay our mortgage? What the, what is wrong with us? This is the downward spiral of building apart from God. And believe me, you know who made parent influencing popular? Christians. It began actually with Mormon moms, um, but it quickly was embraced by evangelicals. And I've actually met a few uh, evangelical influencers who make a lot of money through photos of their kids. I don't think it's all right. I'm just gonna say it, it's my opinion. I, don't, I think it's pretty hard to argue that it's okay. Uh, but this is our nature, this is the voyeuristic quality of building ourselves some kind of immortal remembrance. Um, and it's finding our satisfaction in the things of this world rather than our, in our hope for eternity. And it's a problem. So here they say, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. I, when I, I look at the sin, it's very similar to Adam and Eve. But what, what you see here is they transgress boundaries and the divine prohibition in order to satisfy material and spiritual aspirations independently from God. What was God's command? Be fruitful and go into all the world and be fruitful and multiply. But instead they say, let's come together in one location and let's, let's build upward. Rather than going out into the world, no, let's try to get to God. What I love about the narrative is it says that God had to come down the building was not a success because God had to come down to see what was even being built. Um, and I think that the, the language of coming down is significant to show that you cannot reach God. Um, you cannot build the gates to heaven. Uh, but I think that this, this picture, Genesis 128, is clearly in violation here. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. But where are they trying to find their dominion? Their new dominion is in the heavens. Let's build upward to God to show him that we are our own gods. The builders were futile, attempting to find significance and immortality through their technology and their achievements. And I think uh, if you want to read an incredibly important book, it's a very dense book, um, and it's not a quick read, but I think it's great significant. If you are a reader, um, or even like audiobooks, I think there is an audiobook version of it. The Technological Age by Jacques Ellul um, is considered one of the most important books ever written on the underbelly of technological advance, and it was written in 1948. And the thing is, is that he saw what was coming through our technological achievements, that every technological advance actually has this unbelievable underbelly that generally won't be felt for generations. 
um, because humanity and its sinfulness cannot bring dominion, cannot subdue the world. It can only dominate and destroy it. And so every time, and I think the great examples of, of that is found in our current age, our current culture. We, by all practical, for all practical purposes in America, should be happier than most of the world. Uh, we live longer. Uh, we have more money. We, even for those that consider themselves poor, by the world standards, you're probably still rich. And yet, America has the highest rate of depression and use of drugs to manage a, a deep-rooted um, uh, discomfort with existence uh, because the blessings haven't led to where we thought they would lead. We live longer, but we're not happier. And we have more, but all it does is create a deeper desire for it's never enough. And it becomes an insatiable appetite that is what I refer to as the Pandora's box that was built. And I think there are examples of man's attempt to prove uh, his ability. One of the greatest examples of just human excess, and if you're from this place, it's no knock on you. It's just the way of the world. But have you ever been to, how many of you have ever been to Dubai? Have you been to Dubai? A couple of you. Um, it's the weirdest place on the planet. It really is. The United Emirates, uh, Dubai has the largest, there's lots of uh, challenges to this because the largest skyscraper in the world, but the skyscrapers are generally also, the height is judged by the, often the, uh, um, is the building the top or is it the spire that they put on top of the building? And so there's question, but it's this massive, the, um, the Burj Khalifa, and I've been there. They do this incredible water show at the base uh, to Michael Jackson Thriller. I'm a big fan of Michael Jackson Thriller, but that building was surreal. Here's the thing. Most cities build skyscrapers because they're landlocked. You build up because you can't go out. Not so in Dubai. Dubai's on a vast desert. There is no need for a single skyscraper in a town. And if you go there, it's kind of like Las Vegas. It's like, a, it's like a movie set. And I don't know if you knew this, but there, those, most of those buildings, most of those skyscrapers in that city, um, in, including the tallest one, are for the vastly empty. Entire floors uninhabited. Because the only goal was that they wanted to build the biggest everything. They have the biggest mosque. They have, they have like the world's biggest falafel. Uh, they have the world's biggest mall and they on their billboards it'll say world's biggest and it just to me it just like reeks of first of all it was a it's a Bedouin population that came into oil so it's a very small population that became unbelievably rich and most of the population that lives there is essentially slave labor that comes from India in the in the Philippines that live in literally like small weird towns kept separate from the the nationals that live there who just collect on oil money and they don't come out till 10 p.m it's the weirdest place i've ever been but it is the ultimate emblem of human excess and this attempt we will be remembered for what we have built but it actually doesn't serve any practical purpose other than just being the biggest thing um and i think you're like that's so dumb why would they do that come on America is the home of everything big. When you go to anywhere in Europe, they like laugh at like, why do you need a car that big? Like, because it's America. <laughs> like, like, I want a truck. I, I made the stupid choice of like, I'm an American, I'm going to Italy, I'm gonna get a big car. It's a bad idea. Because the roads aren't made for that. And, and what I realized is that European countries really aren't made for Americans. Uh, because we're loud, we're bombastic, and we also have this fundamental belief that we do everything better than everyone else. Um, and that is a deep problem that finds its root all the way back to the Tower of Babel. This is the problem. But look what happens. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children 
of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is the only beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the divine judgment upon this attempt to unify for the purpose of creating a name for ourselves, to redefine what it means to be human beings, to be our own gods. God's divine judgment is God comes down into the midst of the sin and he notices something he says about human beings because we are divine image bearers. Even if we do not have a living relationship with Jesus, you still are an image bearer of God, though that image is deeply flawed and corrupted. Every arena of the image of God has been infiltrated by sin, but it still exists. It's still there. Human beings are still capable of good. It's just that everything we do is mixture. And what God says about human beings is that when human beings are unified, they can accomplish incredible things. But they have unified around the wrong thing. They have unified around this idea of separation from God. We find our meaning and our purpose in creating a name amongst ourselves. And what God knows is that human beings can only be unified in a fallen state for a short amount of time before desire takes its deadly turn toward a desire for what others have, which always, always throughout all of human history leads to violence. And violence always leads to the, to the rise of the scapegoat. We need someone to blame for the problems that we experience. And the scapegoat becomes the soothing of the violence, but it only lasts until a new scapegoat is needed. In other words, God actually intervenes before the violence kicks in to what it can be. And what I would argue is that God's judgment is often restorative in its quality. Even in Romans 1 when it says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, therefore God gives them over. He gives them over. He gives them over. Give them over. What is the language that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians when a man is caught sleeping with his, with, um, his stepmother? He says, give that man, put him out of fellowship, give his body over, same language, to the devil, that the flesh might be destroyed, that the soul might be restored. And we, hear, we clearly have in 2 Corinthians the, the, the return of that man. It says, hey, if the man has repented, why are you withholding fellowship from him? Return him. I forgive him. You should as well. And this, the point is, is that the judgment is meant to bring restoration. And here is an emblem. That is God's design. Even his judgment flows out of the nature of who he is. He is the God who is love. And I always say it's maybe possible to die unsaved, but it is impossible for anyone to die unloved. And God in his love recognizes the genius of human being, of our industry, our ability to create. But the problem of that apart from God is it will ultimately lead to destruction. And God, instead of allowing human beings to destroy themselves in their common language, in their building to the heavens, and the futility of those things, God disrupts and deconstructs what they have begun um, that he might disperse them for the purpose of putting them back on the track of what he called them to do in the first place, which is to go into all the world. One of the places where the judgment comes is around language. And if language is one of the key aspects of what it means to be human beings, our ability to communicate abstract ideas, to communicate our feelings, God's judgment is human beings in a fallen state. Humans are meant to be together. But we must confuse their language because their togetherness apart from me will not lead to unity, but it will only lead to destruction. And so he actually takes away something that was a blessing, which is the common language, 
the ability to communicate and to name things. And now he confuses the language. And I think that this is a powerful um, picture of God's recognition of the genius of humanity in unity, but the danger of humanity in unity apart from God. And so it ends with the Creator's control. And I think this is important for us today in a time in which our world, especially our nation, is polarized, and especially on election year. I seriously have been having nightmares about leading this church through an election year because it's going to be freaking horrible because there's no, there's no, it's just, yes, it's not okay. My language evades me as I try to communicate the inner turmoil I feel over trying to navigate uh, what is about to happen. Um, but, you know, empires come and go. And that's just reality. Uh, I want to be, you know, as, as optimistic as possible. Uh, so the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Incomplete deconstruction. And what, what does it go on to say? Therefore its name was called Babel. What was thought of as the gates to heaven, and it will become the prototype of all that is against God because it becomes Babylon. Um, and it becomes the primary city that is constantly working against God's chosen people because through God's chosen people would come God's decision for salvation for the world through the Messiah. This is therefore the name was called Babel. City, the gates of heaven becomes a place of confusion because there God, because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over all the face of the earth. Now here is the powerful picture of God's control over his story. Is the dispersion serves as a means of putting humanity back into what God intended it to do, which is to fill the earth. But God's redemptive story will take time to play out. And the arc of that redemptive story is that out of the dispersion of the nations, what we looked at in chapter 10 was 70 nations, which are 70 nations in contrast um, to, to the tribe of Israel uh, and the people of Israel who would become this, this small insignificant nation by which God chooses them, not because of their greatness, but because of their insignificance as a means of showing that, that he will consistently work in ways that is foolishness to man um, as a way of disrupting um, and overturning the, the wisdom of man to show that God has not lost control of his history or his creation. And the dispersion of the nations, it was always God's design that, that his love is for the world, not for a certain, he didn't choose Israel and reject the world. He chose Israel that Israel would be a blessing to all nations. And the blessing to all nations finds its fulfillment in the person of Jesus. I'm not saying that God um, has, uh, has surrendered his covenantal promises to Abraham. I do think that I personally hold to the conviction I'm not a covenantal theologian, which is the church is the replacement of Israel. I don't believe that. But I do believe um, that God's fulfillment of his purposes with nations is, finds its fulfillment in the person of Jesus. It's one of the things that I find so disheartening about the current movement within evangelicalism in America. It's like we've, it's like we've just surrendered any sort of analytical thinking to argue that God is in the business of blessing nations. God doesn't bless nations. He blesses people. And he bless in, in a nation, if a nation is blessed based upon where God is most active, then we would have to say he is blessing China far more than he's blessing America. And so I would say it's not about nations any longer. Nations was a means by which he brought forth his salvation plan. And the salvation plan is a finished work and a finished word 
and it's wrapped up in the person of Jesus. Everything that God has to say to the world, it's not gonna be said through America, it's not gonna be said through some other country, it is said through his son, and every person that commits themselves to King Jesus becomes a conduit of that one message. That one message. And so, before you email me that I'm wrong, that America needs to get back to God. Listen, our great nation is a place that has sent out millions of missionaries. Incredible works have been accomplished in a very short history. We have a very short history. But we also have, is America really a place that we can say has clearly had the thumbprint of God on it from its beginning? Because I would say that God has worked through wherever there were people that really loved him. And even people that loved him did some really bad and dumb things. We have to reckon with slavery. We have to reckon with the fact that we are the country that gave the world pornography and the internet. <laughs> I mean, you may say, well, the internet maybe it was created somewhere else. No, we capitalized on it. That's what America does well. We gave the world McDonald's. You don't think we have to answer for that? Because I'm craving that right now quarter pounder with cheese, no onions, and a frozen Coke. And it's a weakness of mine. And I just want to confess it to all of you, because I'm a part of the problem. <laughs> and the more we understand that we are a part of the problem, and we humble ourselves before our King and recognize that it doesn't matter. It, it matters. Yes, we want to care. We don't want to see our nation go to hell in a handbasket. Um, and we should care about things that matter. But this new call for the church to, uh, that somehow being political is more important than being, being evangelistic is insane. Uh, and, and I think that what we, if you want to see a nation changed, we should see as many people con genuinely converted to the gospel of grace. And all we can do is play our part in this little piece of land that we happen to find ourselves in, the most progressive city in the United States. And how awesome would it be if revival broke out here? And I believe God for that. No matter what comes, I believe God for that. And so I pray that you would understand, and I hope that you see this throughout this whole series, one of the goals is to show that God's intricate engagement with human civilization, his absolute concern and care for every detail, and his ability to fulfill his history and his story in his timing. And what we must do is be faithful until that time comes to its close. So be faithful. Love Jesus. Love your neighbor. It's not an us against them. It's, Lord, we are part of the problem, but as we surrender to you, we can be a part of the solution. And I pray that that's what Door of Hope recognizes. Because God's blessing our church right now. I mean, it's looking more and more likely that we are going to um, uh, move, be, be granted another location, which we've got to start praying and thinking about. But that's the goal, is we want to see healthy, gospel-centered communities throughout the city. And I want to grow not because we've played into a particular group um, and, its, and its obsessions, I think Door of Hope will always suffer because of our refusal to pick sides. And I am happy to suffer that kind of pain because I think that I would be far more distraught if I collapsed to one side or the other. I refuse to play the right or the left. I want to look up and see my king and go out into the world as he's commanded me. And may we all do that together. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gospel and its ability to bring transformation to our lives. And we pray right now that as we enter into this time of worship, this time of communion, um, this time, Lord, of prayer, that you would be a God who makes known your powerful presence. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we collapse under the pressures of a culture that is consistently trying to make a name for itself. 
and for the ways that we participate in those same false ideas. Life is not ours to live as we want. We are not free to do whatever we want. And the freedom of the gospel is the freedom to do what is right under the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that we would take Paul's words seriously. Do not use your freedom to serve the flesh. But Lord, we want to freely lay our lives down at the feet of you, our good shepherd. And pray that you would lead us into the world as you see fit. And that we would recognize that our lives are not our own, but they are yours, Jesus. Forgive us for the ways that we become so distracted by all that the world has to offer. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Lord, we can feel those pressures. We can feel that weight. I pray, Lord, that we would live life with open hands. And that, Lord, when we build, that we would be building into your kingdom by the power of your spirit. That, Lord, the name that would be lifted up in our lives would be your name. Lord, I pray that for Door of Hope. I pray Door of Hope would not be known for any particular personality, not me or anyone else, but that it would just be simply known as a church where people really loved you and really met you. And so, Lord, would you bless that? And would you bless us right now with your presence? We humbly come before you recognizing Lord, our brokenness and our need for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.